Good morning, actually almost good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today and taking your time on Saturday to come with us and learn a little bit more about um, tantrums and how to increase compliance in your young children. I'll talk to you a little bit about who I am and what we're gonna talk about today. And then I'll leave some time at the end for questions. We don't have that much time. So I'm gonna go through the presentation probably a little quickly. And then um, that way we make sure we leave time for questions. If we get to the end and there's no questions, I'll go back and talk a bit more about some of the things you maybe we talked over. So first I want to tell you a little bit about me and who I am and why I think I'm a good person to talk to you today. Um, I've been teaching ESE preschool for 24 years in Orange County Public Schools until moving this year to become a district resource teacher. I have a bachelor's in special education and a master's in early childhood development. I have specialization in infant and toddler development, and I also have advanced trainings in early childhood behavior and infant mental health. Um, so you'll notice a lot of this presentation is geared towards young children, because that is my area of expertise, but um, a lot of these strategies will be able to be applied to children of all ages. So please stay, um, feel free to stay and listen. But all those things aside, the only real expert on, the on your child is you, even, when you bring your child to someone like me or to your teacher, we only come with the strategies, but you're the one who gives us all the information about your kiddo. Trust your parent, your mama, data, guardian, gut, and know what your child needs. Only you know your child best. So I just want to do some quick lessons on the brain before we get started into like the strategies and ideas. So child development 
is critical during this period of time. Tantrums, boundary testing, all of those things are natural parts of child development. That's why they're called the terrible twos. And sometimes they're called the three nagers because it's just difficult times. And it's, it is actual, it's absolutely critical for their development that they go through these stages. But just because their brain is telling them they need or want these things doesn't mean they should get it. And when we talk about tantrums, that's where we see tantrums happening. Their brain and body is telling them to do this or they need or they want this, but yet they can't have it for various reasons. And that's when we see the tantrums developing. So I know I'm sure some of you have seen on Facebook the, the memes of why my kids are crying. Here's just a few of my favorite, but they make me laugh all the time because you know, these children really believe and think this is what they need and want. But as parents and as life, we know that's not always the case. And here we see why tantrums happening. They, I love it. If you haven't found it, go on Facebook and you'll laugh all day. This is my favorite little picture of the brain. It comes from um, Conscious Discipline Brain State Model by Becky Bailey. I love Conscious Discipline. I love Becky Bailey. She's in the resource section at the end. You'll see a link for her. She is great. I like to look at the brain kind of like this. It's the easiest way to really explain and show what is happening in your child's brain where we go from your sweet, happy child into the screaming, rageful tantrum with shoes flying and chairs going and the whole big thing. So kind of look at it. I like to say kind of like a volcano. The green is when you're great. You can hike on it. You can look at it in the distance. Everything is beautiful. It's a nice, sunny, wonderful day on that, on that little island. The blue is your warning. We're starting to get a little emotional. We're starting to see it coming. There's rumblings. There's some smoke. It's starting to happen. The grunting and the uhs and the uh and the tightness is starting to show. You know something's about to happen. And then the red, it's too late. You're in survival mode. Brain stems kicked in. Fight, fight, or fight, fight, fight freeze, all those great things. And uh, the brain just exploded. There's just lava. It's all coming out. Like if you think of the little guy from inside out, you know, it's just rah, the steam. Once they're in that red state, like you would do if there was a true volcano, you give it space and you back up. So those are the easiest way to understand the different stages of a tantrum. And so we'll be talking about this throughout the presentation. So I'll be referring back to it just a couple more times. So let's talk a little bit about tantrums. Tantrums are common in child development. It's part of growing up. It's part of figuring out who you are, what you like, what you don't like, what the boundaries are. It's a typical part of development. We don't want to actually eliminate them because it's what the kids need to do. It's just figuring out how to shorten them, control them, and learn to live with them. So I like to say there's two different kinds of tantrums. There's the tantrum that's out of frustration because they don't understand. They don't understand what you're trying to tell them. You don't understand what they're trying to say. And it's a lack of understanding, which causes the frustration, which causes a tantrum. And then there is a tantrum that is they understand. They just don't like it. And so you have to look at those differently because they require different interventions. If it is a lack of understanding tantrum, we want to use that opportunity to teach the understanding. If it's they don't like what you have to say, well, then that's too bad. Life goes on. And you walk away, let them have their let them have their moments because feelings are okay. So it's okay if they feel sad about this, they're allowed to. So how do you know? So this is what I do with children when they start having a tantrum. I try and you know your child best. So you try and figure out what is it they're tantruming over. Are you are you sad you wanted a cookie? You wanted more tablet time? You wanted to go outside? Is that what you wanted? And typically the child, yes, I want the cookie. I want the tablet. Okay. I understand you wanted a cookie and now you feel mad or you feel sad. It's okay to feel that way. That's a good feeling to have. You feel mad or sad because you wanted a cookie. Yes, I wanted a cookie. Okay. 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 Yes. You can have that cookie. You can have it. You can have it after you eat your dinner or tomorrow morning when you wake up. When do you want to eat your cookie? So they're not hearing the word no, which causes tantrums. They're hearing yes, which every kid loves the word yes. Yes, you can have it. Here is when it's okay to have those things. You can have your tablet after we eat dinner. You can go outside when the sun comes back up. These are the things that you can do. So that way you have an understanding. They, you understand them. They know you understand them. They understand you. You know what the situation and the problem is. When it's going to be resolved, you're good. Now, I know the kids are going to say, but I want it now. 
I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I want it right now. I want to have it right now. I don't want to wait. Okay, well, we can have it after dinner or you can have it tomorrow. And that's when you're going to get it. Then the tantrum happens. But now we have a tantrum of, I don't like your answer versus you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. So now once we understand and they're just mad because they want to have it now and they don't wait till tomorrow. All right, well, that's okay. You can be mad about it, but that's the rule of this house and you can be mad. That's fine. That you're allowed to be mad. And then let them cry it out and self-regulate. It's very, very, very important for later emotional regulation that you resist the urge to rescue. The child needs the practice of self-soothing when they're upset. This is not like when they fall down and have a boo-boo or they have their feelings hurt. No, definitely you want to comfort and support your child. But when they're just mad because they couldn't have what they wanted and they're just mad, they need to learn to calm themselves down. They're going to have disappointments for the rest of their life. And they need to know, okay, this is what I need to do when I feel upset. They need to practice. If you're always running over to redirect and rescue, they're not going to know how to do it themselves. And you're not always going to be there as they get older. So why are all those steps important? Why is it important to ask them the questions, to get them to get them talking and get them engaging to you? Even if you're not using verbal words because your child is nonverbal, you can use picture cards that say yes or no, and they can tap the one they want. Whatever you get to do that gets them engaged and involved. Why is that important? Because look at our brain model. If the child is in the blue, which is typically when you want to start your interventions, you see them getting frustrated, you see it coming, and you can get them talking, you get them back to the green. The goal is to get them back to green. And going from blue to green is a lot easier than going from red to green. Once they get to that red, there's no talking. There's no comprehension. They are in the fight flight. You know, the brainstem is activated. You can't talk. You just have to wait for them to calm them down, calm down enough to get to the blue. And then during the blue, you can use your strategies. So if you can catch them at the blue and get them thinking, get them talking about when do I want that cookie? What can I have instead of a cookie? Well, you can't have a cookie now. Would you like an apple or an orange? Hmm, let me think about that. So it gets them thinking and keeps them in that cognitive brain, which is where you want them to stay for problem solving and rational thinking, which is very important. So we're talking a little bit about compliance because the more compliant your kid are, the less tantrums you're going to have. And so I really believe in being a proactive parent and versus a reactive parent. The more you can be proactive and anticipate what's going to be the challenges and have your strategies already in place, it's much better than being a reactive parent where the tantrums and behaviors are already happening and now you have to try and correct them. So if you can go into things knowing these activities are what are going to be challenging for my, my, my students but, or my child, and let me think how I can set that up. It, you know bath time is a trigger for them. So instead of saying, hey, it's time for a bath, no, I don't want a bath. I don't want to wash my hair. Okay, no. Hey, it's time for a bath. Do you want bubbles or no bubbles in your bath? Hey, it's time for dinner. Do you want your red plate or your blue plate? Then it takes away the focus of being the thing they don't like, which is the bath or dinner, and puts the focus on something that might be more positive. Bubbles or no bubbles, red plate or blue plate. It gives them a little bit more control so they feel like they have some power, especially important for our power struggling children than to just force a choice on them. Then also what's really important for you to do is to state your request and the consequence and the time frame. It helps you to know what your consequence is gonna be prior so you're not stuck in the moment trying to figure it out and it helps the child to know what they're, what they're getting ready to do. So I always say, I need you to take your bath or you're not gonna have your book for bedtime by the time I count to three. I need you to sit down at the table or you will not have any dessert by the time I count to three. I need you to finish brushing your teeth or you will not get a story before bedtime, before the timer goes off. You know, so that they have the full picture, what you want them to do, when they have to do it by, and what the consequence will be. Because now they know and now they made the choice. So when they get mad and say, you didn't let me have dessert. Well, no, you made that choice. You knew you had to sit at the table and or you weren't going to get your dessert. So now you don't have dessert because you chose not to sit at the table. They made that choice now because they knew the full thing. And the biggest thing of that is that you have to follow through. If you say you're not getting dessert, then there's no dessert. 
if they cry and they whine and they beg and like, I know I will. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I will eat it all. I'll eat everything right now. Well, that's great. You can try again tomorrow, but tonight you don't get your dessert. We'll try again tomorrow. <sighs> and then they go into their tantrum, but that's okay. Cause they're having a tantrum because they're not happy. Not because they don't understand because we explained it to them already. And they can have their tantrums. Yes, I see that makes you very sad that you don't get dessert tonight. I'm sorry you made that choice. Tomorrow we'll try again and make better choices. And just walk away. If it's going to break your heart on the inside, just walk away. Don't, don't look at them. Don't look at their tears. And I want to talk a little bit about those consequences that you've set up. I really believe in natural consequences. Those are the best and easiest to do for your children. It also gives them immediate feedback. A natural consequence is something that's going to happen naturally in the environment. We all do that in our typical lives. Like if we don't put on our jacket, we're cold. It's a natural consequence. And we want to look at that for our kids because they're immediate and they give immediate feedback. When you do consequences that happen later on, then they forget why they're even in trouble. So like if they misbehave in the morning, it's like, okay, that's it. Tomorrow night, you're not going to the show. They're not going to remember that. That's this disconnected. It needs to be immediate in the moment so they can make the connection that their behavior equal to reaction. And so, so not everything needs to be a timeout. Like if they're throwing toys, toys get put away. If they are not being kind on the playground, we go back inside. Taking something away later doesn't help and it also can also start the tantrum over again. So if you take away something in the morning, like say you're going to Chuck E. Cheese tomorrow night and it's this morning and they misbehave, that's it. Now you're not going to Chuck E. Cheese tomorrow. Well, one, are you really not going to go to Chuck E. Cheese tomorrow? Are you and your whole family going to miss this outing because of this one behavior? Or are you going to tell them like you have to stay home and we're all going to go? And then if you do, what is your, what do you have to keep motivating your child for the rest of the day? You already took away Chuck E. Cheese. So now it's after lunchtime and now they're misbehaving. So now what? And then in two weeks from now, well, you're not going to get this. You run out of things. You have to make it immediate and make it natural. I kind of look at it like if you were an hour late to work and your boss said, okay, even though you were only an hour late, we're not going to pay you for the whole rest of the day. You're not going to stay at work. You're going to go home and be like, I'm not getting paid anyway. It's the same thing when we reward our children. If you take away it first thing in the morning, there's no motivation for them to keep following and following directions throughout the day. I also like to take a look at behaviors versus can't versus won't. A lot of times when talking to teachers or talking to parents, I'll say, is it a can't behavior or a won't behavior? If it's a can't behavior, that requires compassion. That's when we teach and we model. If it's I can, but I won't do it, that requires a consequence. I like to use the easy example of teaching a child to walk. You wouldn't put a consequence on your infant because they're not walking. When your infant can't walk, you help them. We show you how we stand. We're going to take practice steps. We're going to teach you all the different ways to get walking. And then we're going to get walking. If your four-year-old who is able to walk decides to lay on the floor in the middle of a grocery store, that requires a consequence because we know she can walk and she's choosing not to. So you have to look at it can't versus won't. If your child is pointing at the cabinet and going, eh, eh, and they're nonverbal, we don't punish them. We say, okay, listen, say cookie, cookie. If they can talk and they're verbal and they're going, eh, you say, okay, then you don't get a cookie if you're not going to use your words. You have to know if you need to teach or if you need a consequence. I want to talk a little bit about timeout because sometimes timeouts are necessary. Timeouts are helpful not only for your child, but for you. Sometimes you all need a break and it's self-care for the parent. If you're getting frustrated that you need to time out for them or you, it's okay. But some tips for timeouts is that I really recommend you always use a timer. The best way is just to have a digital timer, like one of those kitchen timers already set at three, four minutes, press it and walk away. So you're not fumbling with your phone, trying to find the timer, but you can use your phone if you need to. I really recommend the timer because you want the child to know the timeout is finished because the timer went off, not because of a behavior that they did. You don't want them to make the association that I cried, I whined, I did this, and that's why I get out of timeout because then they're going to go right to those behaviors the next time because that's what they think gets them out of timeout. It's not anything that they can do. The timer just goes off. Not even you as a parent can get them out of timeout. The timer has to do it. 
Um, and then I always say, don't add time back on the timer. You'll, be, you'll stay there all day. If you don't stop crying, it's another minute. If you throw, it's another minute. If you say it's another minute, and then you minute, and then a minute, and then they yell, and then a minute, and then you're there for an hour and a half, and you're both exhausted, and nothing really gets done. Three minutes is three minutes. You're done. They're done. While they're in timeout, it's limited attention as possible. That means no verbal attention, no physical attention. I don't like, but for, I don't recommend for parents to be like, see, this is why you're in timeout because you're crying too much, and if you don't stop crying too much, you're just feeding it. You're just fueling it. They need that time. They need that break. No physical attention, no hugs, no good job at sitting in timeout. You're doing a great job sitting in timeout. No, nothing. We're just, everyone's taking a break. If intervention is needed for safety, then you can do it, but do it without voice or eye contact. Gently move them back to the timeout area. If they're banging their head or they're going, you just stand there and block them without eye contact. Just stand there. If timeout isn't going to work for your child, the timeout doesn't have to be your child. It can be a removal of a toy. If they are throwing a toy, are they misbehaving when that toy is getting removed? If timeout is, if timeout for your child is not useful for you, you can go to timeout. You put yourself in timeout. I always say it's fine. If you say, okay, you're not, you're not listening to mommy and daddy. We're not playing safely right now. You're not playing kind with your brother and sister. We're going to take a break and then you can go to timeout. And I, you know, you go in the kitchen, your timeout could be anything. You don't say even timeout. I, okay, we're, we're taking a break. And then you go and you get your phone and you just hang out in the kitchen for a few minutes until the child is ready to then to rejoin you appropriately. And another thing for timeout is that it should not be in their room. Their room should be their safe space. We don't want to make it a consequence space. So I would recommend timeout be somewhere in the main site on your main eyesight line. So chair, couch, somewhere in that area. I'm not particularly a fan of they have to sit against the wall kind of a thing. If they're in the timeout area, I don't care if they're on the floor, if they're in the chair, if they're rolling around, it's not the idea that they're sitting quietly in timeout. It's just the message that what your behavior is not acceptable and we need to reset ourselves right now. Timeout is after timeout is the time for explanations and reminders, not during. So when timeout is all done, that's when I want you to give the hugs, reconnect and say, listen, you made some tough choices. Maybe we had big feelings for small problems or whatever the situation is. Remember our strategies. Let's try practicing them. And, let, and then you have to talk about it. That's the time for that. Because why? They're back in the greens part of their brain. And now they can comprehend and they can have conversations. A little bit about timeout versus calm down areas. I know people sometimes prefer, refer to timeout as a calm down space. I don't like to do that. I like to have them separate. Timeout is a consequence and calming down area is a coping strategy. And we don't want to put a negative connotation onto the calm down area, onto a coping strategy. I believe they are separate. Timeout, consequence. Calming down, I want to teach our children like, okay, I see you're in the blue. I see you're starting to get there. Would you like to go take a break? It's not trouble. It's a break. It's a strategy. We need to go take a break for yourself for a few minutes and go to the calming down area. You can make a designated calming area, and I'll show you some visuals that can help support that in just a few minutes. But so you can make a dedicated calm down area. A lot of times children will pick their own calm down area, which is fine. I had students that would go under the table. I had students that would go behind the door. I'm like, it's fine. You're taking your break, and that's the point, is that you're recognizing that your body needs to take a moment, and you're taking a break. So I recommend calming area and then a timeout area, and they're not the same. In your calming area, I think there are some, my next slide. Oh no, I'll get there in a minute. So we'll talk a little bit about developmental challenges as well. Like I know a lot of our children, that's why we're all here, have developmental needs and language impairments, emotional regulation, ADHD and impulsivity, anxiety, sensory integration, and a whole host of other things. But their brains are still their brains and development still development. And they're gonna go through these stages. And just knowing what your child's unique and special needs are will help you to determine the best strategies and interventions that you're gonna to need to use for that and what they need. Visuals are universal. I recommend that no matter what developmental challenge your child has, visuals are the best. Even if they don't have any developmental, any developmental challenges, visuals are the key because when your brain is not in that green space and it's in the blue, especially in the red, processing language and words isn't going to be useful. Visuals can go right directly to the brain without having to go through any kind of cognitive thinking. I love visuals. So in your calm down area, you can have a calm down basket, which can have their squishies, weighted blankets, books that they like, any kind of things that will settle them down. You can put visuals, the I can calm visuals, and you can create these with your child yourself. You can come up with them together. 
I love this little um, chart that I found in a school that says when I am mad. And so it kind of helps remind them of mm. what they need to do. And they have to put a little check mark when they do it, which is super helpful because by taking it and check marking it and doing something brings them from that red to the blue to the green because they have to use their cognitive brain to move through to make those check marks. So all those are really great things. If you can't um, make them yourself, all you have to do is go to Google and Google common, common corner visuals or any kind of you know strategies and you will get so much. Pinterest, teacher, pay teacher, all of them. There are so many that are ready made for you on the internet that you can find. And if you really can't find any that you like on the internet, I would reach out to maybe your child's teacher because their school should have a behavior specialist or someone that can support you in making these visuals at home because most likely they're also using them in school. So it'll be a great homeschool connection for you as well. The time to practice these is not when they're upset. I, my one recommendation for you is if you're going to use a calming corner, you have to teach these strategies when you're in the green space in the brain, when you're calm, not when they're starting to get upset because they're not going to intuitively know what these pictures mean. So we have to explain them and practice them and make a fun game out of them. So during when they get to that blue space, when they're starting, oh, I see you're getting a little upset. Why don't we practice one of our calming things that we've been working on? Would you like to blow bubbles? Would you like to squeeze? Would you like to breathe? What should we do from our calming chart? Let's go take a look and help them get back to that green. And you might want to practice it for yourself when you feel frustrated. Like, oh, mommy's feeling very frustrated right now about, you know, dinner's not working, whatever it is. Oh, mommy's feeling frustrated. I'm going to take one of my calming strategies. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and calm. And so you model for them how to do that as well. So that way both you and them can all have these strategies and you can work on those together. Some common mistakes when it comes to behavior management that I see a lot with families is that one is not giving a direction that it's very important that you replace a behavior with the behavior saying, don't jump, don't run. That Okay, what are they supposed to do instead? Tell them what the other choices are. Jumping on the bed is not safe. You may lay down or you may sit on the bed. Running is not safe. You may use walking feet or you can, well, actually all you can use is walking feet. You can walk independently or you can walk holding my hand. You give them alternative choices to the behavior so they have other skills to replace it with. That's when you also, if they still jump on the bed, that's when you put your consequence in there. If you jump on the bed one more time, you are leaving this room. So you give them the choices, what they can do. And if they test it, okay, well, if you jump on the bed one more time, you have to leave the room. They jump on the bed one more time, you walk over, you take them out the room. No more warnings. You already gave it to them. Nothing. I mean it. I really mean it. Don't you jump again. Whaley, one more time. Okay, really? Jump on the bed. Sorry, you made your choice. Out the room you go. Um, saying only their name or saying just, no, stop. Again, what do you want them to do? I one time worked with a family and their child was climbing on the counters and the dad said, Charlie. Charlie stopped, looked at the dad and went climbing back on the counter. And the dad said, see, she doesn't listen. I said, actually, she listens really well. She looked right at you when you said her name. You didn't. That's all you told her. You didn't tell her what else to do. So you called her name. She looked and she went back on to playing. You have to say, then Charlie, get. I need you to get off the counter. You may stand by the counter. You may walk away from the counter, but we may not stand on top of the counter. You know, what do you want her to do? You have to tell them what you want them to do. Be clear. And then when I know a lot of parents and a lot of teachers say, use your words. I hear that all the time, which is a great strategy. But do you know if your child knows what those words are? Use your words. What words am I using? Curse words? I mean, what, what words? What, what do I need to say? Use your words. I need you to say, I want more, please. I need you to say, stop, please. Use your words and say X, Y, and Z. Tell them what those words are. They're not going to automatically unknow. You need to teach what those words are. It's the same with saying things like be nice. You need to be nice to your friends. What, what does be nice mean? They don't know what be nice means. That's a very gray word. What is be nice? Let's talk about that. When we go to the park, don't say we're going to be nice. When we go to the park, we're going to keep our hands to ourselves. When we go to the park, 
we're going to use quiet voices. When we do this, this is what the expectations are. When we go out to dinner, you're going to behave. What's behave? When we go to dinner, I expect you to sit at the table. I expect this. If you want dessert after your dinner, these are the behaviors that I expect. And the other thing is that, you know, making assumptions of what they want or why they are getting upset. A lot of times I'll see parents just brush off their children. It's just because they wanted their tablet. It's just because they didn't get their cookie. It's just because, I'm like, well, is it really? Did we, did we ask them that? Because sometimes it isn't that. And we just, we're busy. We have children. We have all these things going on in our lives. And we don't have time to stop and ask and go through what is wrong. But sometimes you can stop a long-term tantrum by just stopping all and say, okay, wait, everyone stop. What is a matter? What is it that you want? What? What is it? And take a moment. And then you can do the strategies we discussed earlier with, okay, I understand. You're upset because you wanted the toy that she is playing with. Is that right? Yes. You wanted that toy. Okay. Yes. I hear you. You can have that toy as soon as she is finished. And you kind of just go through that. Some of my favorite recommendations um, is the whole, the whole child, the whole brain child, no drama discipline by Daniel Siegel. I really love that book. It does a really great job of, of explaining the child and the developing child and their brain. So it gives you great un understanding of the research and the science behind all of the things that we're talking about doing. I don't recommend too many general behavior books for families because every child is so different. And even if you have two children, they can be on two completely different behavior plans because every child is unique in their own way. So I typically don't recommend behavior books because they're not cookie cutter. However, this is the best book that I found so far that's as general as can be. And most of the strategies do work with most children. It's called Setting Limits with Your Strong-Willed Child revised and expanded second edition. It's a really great book that teaches you how to use those choices and how to use um, strategies that will keep you from having those power struggles with your child. Because when you get into a power struggle with your child, neither one of you win. You just fire, 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 and then you're exhausted. It'll kind of help you how to navigate and stay around those power struggles. And then Conscious Discipline is always a great choice. It's by Becky Bailey. I definitely recommend that you look at her website and her techniques and strategies. She has a lot of great videos on her website. All of those will be really helpful and will mimic and mirror a lot of what we talked about today. We have a little bit of time. I'm going to ask, I'm going to leave some space for questions. If there's no questions, I'm going to continue talking about some more ideas, but I wanted to see if anyone had any questions. I'm, I'm seeing, nope, there are no questions. Um, so if they come in, feel free to ask. And if not, I do want to talk a little bit more about some things. One of the other things that I did want to talk to you a little bit about today was um, behavior charts and behavior plans. I get that question a lot with my teachers in the classroom as well as parents at home. You know, what kind of behavior plans can we do at home? You can do many. And again, if you go on Pinterest to Google, you'll find hundreds. My advice with those is you need to make them very, very clear. If you do stickers, if you do check marks, whatever it is that you decide to do, it needs to be very clear as to what, what the behavior is that they're doing to earn those check marks. And don't verbally tell them, visually tell them. If it's a potty training, if it's whatever it is, visual, potty, picture, so that they can know and understand what the expectations for behavior that earn them those stars. Practice it, model it. This is how we're going to do it. And this is how you earn your star. Set up in advance what the reward is going to be. It doesn't have to be a big thing like we're going to go to the zoo. Sometimes for the kids, just getting the sticker or the star is just as exciting as anything else. It can be daily. If you get five by the end of the day today, you're going to get an extra story at bedtime. You'll get dessert for din after dinner. It can be a morning reward at lunch and then from lunch to dinner. You have to just kind of look at the frequency in which you want to do it, but make sure it is clear to the child what it is that they're earning and working for. So when they don't get it, they understand why, why they didn't get it. I also recommend putting the behaviors that are the unexpected and not behaviors that you want to see. I know it doesn't sound like the right idea to put the negative behaviors, but sometimes children don't understand the alternative. So if you're doing, say, a potty training and you have a potty training, and every time you go pee-pee in the potty, you get a star. Okay, so does that also mean if I pee pee on the floor do I get a star is it just the potty if I pee pee my pull up does that mean like you have to be clear pee pee in the potty and then have a picture that says no pants no floor like we're just pee peeing in the potty 
that they understand exactly what the expectation is that they're going to earn that star and what the rewards are going to be. Absolutely never take away once they've earned it. If they've earned their star and then later the, and their behavior, that's it. I'm taking away your stars. If that was not part of the plan, don't do it. You don't take, you don't get your, uh, out your money taken out of your paycheck past getting paid. So once they get that star, it's theirs, what they do the rest of the day. And that's why I really recommend and encourage that you have a multiple reward system throughout the day. So if they don't get their star at 8 a.m., they have a chance to get it at 9, 10, 11, 12. So if, they're, if they have the opportunity to earn 10 stars on Monday, then the reward should be eight stars because we want to give them room for error. We want to give them space to have oopsies and uh-ohs throughout the day because nobody is perfect, not us, not them, that is for sure. So that's some of my guidance for using a reward star system. I'm not a fan of the green, yellow, blue. If you're a teacher watching this and we have the clothespins and you move them, I'm not a fan of those. I never recommend those. All they do is make the good kids good and the bad kids bad. It doesn't remotivate or reward behavior. It's also a very negative system because then it creates bullying because, you know, always Johnny's on the red. There's Johnny on the red. So I don't recommend those for at home or for at school. They're just, they're not positive. I'm going to pause again. Any more questions? Nope. Still no questions. Oh, wow. I'm just doing that. Great. I'm covering everything. All right. So let me think of some other things that I can see. I'm going to go back through the presentation and just see if there's anything else that I want to talk about. Um, I really prefer questions because then I can answer what you need to know, not what I feel like you want to hear. I feel like I've covered everything so well. I don't know if there's anything left for me to say. Maybe we'll just uh, take a few minutes to end a little early. Yeah, no, I think I've covered everything I needed to say. So if there's no questions. Oh, yeah. So if you have any questions that come later and you're like, oh, I wanted to ask or I should have asked or if you're watching this recording later and you thought, oh, I wish I was there because I would have wanted to ask her this. Uh, my my email will be in the chat box, but it is going to be J A I M E dot P O L L A C K at OCPS dot net and Jamie dot Pollock at OCPS dot net. That is my address. Email is the best way to reach me because I'm in the schools pretty much every day. So I'm not at my desk. So if you call me, you're going to get my voicemail. And when I call you back, I don't know because I'm never at my desk. But email is the best and easiest way to reach me. J-A-I-M-E dot Pollock at OCPS dot net. It's in the chat, I hear. I've been told it is in the chat. All right. Well, if nothing else, then thank you for listening today. And I look forward to maybe hopefully seeing or meeting you one day. <laughs>